Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Pig Health Today, and with me is Dr. Mike Tokash. He is a nutritionist and extension swine specialist at Kansas State University. Welcome, Mike. Well, thank you. It's great to see a nutritionist at the American Association of Swine Veterinarians meeting. Yes, well, there's, there's more of us nutritionists that show up every year because we understand the importance of working together with the veterinarians uh, on some of the health aspects and, and trying to work for the success of the pork producer, which we all are interested in. Now, there's a lot of pressure on veterinarians to back off antibiotics. I mean, they've been using them responsibly all along, but with consumer trends, uh, and then also just regulatory matters with the veterinary feed directive, uh, people are using fewer antibiotics than, than they used to. It, it, can nutrition play a role in, in filling that void? Well, it certainly plays a role in trying to make sure that the pigs are healthy and, and reduces the need for antibiotics. I think that one of the things that, that we always have to start off with when we talk about this area, of course, is that all of our pigs go to market without any antibiotics in their system, and, and that, that's part of the, our, our regulations in the United States. But people ha have had an increased desire to have uh, pork from pigs that, that have, have not ever been treated in their lifetime. And so we've been trying to work with some of our producers on trying to, to figure out if there's some ways or some things we can do, not only environmentally and, and, and production-wise, but also with the diets to reduce their their need uh, to be treated. Now, specifically, you've been looking at the nursery diets? Yes, the nursery diets in particular, but it also influences uh, what we do with the sow diets also and how we feed the sow in the farrowing house. Just an example, we want to make sure that the pigs have adequate colostrum consumption. And so we try to maximize colostrum production by how we feed that sow before she farrows uh, so that we get the pig off to a good start. And what's the key to doing that nutritionally? Well, one, some of the research is telling us that how we feed the sow in that last 48 to 72 hours before she farrows, the amount of feed that we get into her uh, is, is one of the keys, is if we can increase the amount of consumption shortly before she farrows, we increase the amount of nutrients that are coming from that diet at being uh, going through the colostrum versus if she's fed uh, below her requirement, sometimes producers tend to back off consumption, uh, maybe a little bit too much before the sow farrows, wor worried that they're gonna have constipation if they have too much feed in the system. And so uh, by reducing their consumption, they reduce the amount of nutrients that are available and that decreases the amount of nutrients from the diet that go into the colostrum. And so more the sow ends up breaking down some of her body reserves and, and we end up reducing both total colostrum uh, quantity, but also the quality. Now, post-weaning, uh, I, I would think that that would be the last area where you would want to pull the antibiotics. I mean, the pigs are at a very fragile state, and volume-wise, you're not really using a lot of antibiotic to begin with, that's exactly right. yet you're, that's a focus of, of your research. Well, Why? Well, it's because if the consumer doesn't want any antibiotics in, in the pig ever in their lifetime, uh, they, that's, that's obviously the area that you're exactly right. The, they get, we get the biggest benefit from using antibiotics, and there's the biggest need uh, shortly after weaning. And so that becomes the area that we really have to focus on so that we can try to minimize the usage. And, and so we look at, at the diet-wise, what type of things we can put in the diet from like immunoglobulins as an example, the lactose content, what we do with soy proteins and introducing those to the pigs so that they can handle them correctly and, and trying to minimize the amount of anti-nutritional factors in the diet mm -hmm. and just a, a few of the things that we're working on. So Tell me a little bit more about the research that you presented at AASV. Well, I, I actually did more of a review of a number of things that, that people need to be thinking about and when they're looking at their diets. And, and, and it really applies to not only whether you're in a minimal antibiotic situation, but also in a conventional production where uh, just, just uh, most of these are, are good production practices in the first place. Sometimes the antibiotics uh, can help us out in some areas where the diets may be a little bit uh, below the pig's requirement. They help to cover up some of the problems that, that can occur and those things really rear their head when we pull back on the use or we, or we eliminate the antibiotics in the diet or, or through injections. So is there one particular type of product that is a must-have for nursery pigs when the antibiotics are not being given? No, I don't think there's any one thing that you absolutely have to do. I think there's a number of tools that you want to consider and, and consider to, to do in the diet. Probably the biggest things that we want to think about is making sure that we don't uh, miss any of the requirements. And so first off, the diet has to meet the requirements of the pig. And then we want to look at our ingredients that we put in the diet, make sure none of those ingredients are causing a problem uh, either with the digestibility. So we want to have very high digestible diets and, and digestible ingredients. 
We also want to make sure that if we can reduce the, the impact on, on diarrhea, like something like in, immunoglobulin products, or um, the, the be biggest cure for poor growth and diarrhea is high intake. And so it, making sure that our even simple things like the sodium level in the diet uh, that often can be shorted immediately after weaning because the pig has such high sodium requirements. So uh, in your review, uh, though, they have do like a, a few, um, I guess you'd call them nutritional supplements. Yep. Some um, of the additives. Yeah, some of the additives. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do some stand out more than others in terms of their potential for replacing or partially replacing antibiotics? Well, I wouldn't really call them replacements. The way I like to term it is, is do we get growth promotion benefits from some of these products and reductions in mortality, whether we use antibiotics or not, but they, they sometimes be, it becomes more apparent when antibiotics aren't in the diet. And a good example would be zinc oxide. We, we've used zinc oxide for a number of years to help control E. coli um, uh, diarrhea as an example. We know that zinc oxide gives us a pretty strong growth response in the first two to three weeks after weaning. And so that's one of the ones that we, w it's pretty well applied across the industry. Mm -hmm. Other additives that we look at in that phase is things like um, increased levels of phytase to reduce the, the phytic acid and some of the, the, the problems that pigs have with, with phytic acid breakdown. There's um, the direct fed microbials. Uh, when you take the zinc oxide and you take the antibiotics out of the diet, some of those really show promise and show benefits. Sometimes we don't see that when we have either an antibiotic or the zinc oxide uh, present. And you mentioned growth promotion. I mean, is that the, the, the main goal of all this? Because we know that antibiotics have some growth promotion benefit or do these nutritional supplements actually improve the health of the animal? Well, they do help improve the health, and that's we. I think the most sensitive way to, to measure whether we improve the health is measure whether they're growing faster. And, and so that, that's one of the ways that we measure whether the products are having a benefit or not. But we obviously want to look at things like, uh, like diarrhea and whether we're reducing the amount of diarrhea that the pigs have, or, or obviously mortality, something that the producers are obviously want to avoid, but also that hurts the bottom line. And so, so products, uh, when, when we look at these, mo most of the trials have looked at the growth promotion standpoint. There's been relatively few until recently uh, that have really do been done in a large enough scale to really test the impact on, on the amount of, of treatments, the amount of injections that the pigs have to receive, or on mortality. Now, um, for many years, people would say, well, you know, pork producers are, are using antibiotics to promote growth. Um, do antibiotics really promote growth or is that really a secondary benefit of them doing something else to alter the condition of the gut? Well, that's, that's a good question, and, and I, don't, I still don't think we really know. Yeah, we, we've had antibiotics around for a very long time, and we know some of the modes of action, but we don't know all of them. There, so there's, there's still some mystery a little bit about exactly what antibiotics are doing, and you may be thinking about it more as a chicken versus egg. Does growth, yeah. growth improve, and so then they, they, they're healthier, or does the health improve, and thus they grow faster and eat more feed? Uh, most of them are through an increase in feed consumption is the reason that they grow faster. Uh, there is a little bit of benefit on efficiency, but mostly it's a growth uh, uh, feed intake, and especially in the nursery stage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't know if we know the answer to your question. Yeah, and and because I've had people tell me, well, the reason they got claims such as in improved growth rate, increased feed conversion is because they were easy to measure, easy to demonstrate to FDA. Yeah. But yes. really, it's it's really about more altering the yeah. the, the whole environment of the gut, it seems. Well, certainly it does alter the environment of the gut and different antibiotics do that in different ways, but, but also it also has effects on digestibility of nutrients. It has uh, effects on, you know, that would be in the gut where it thins the gut wall so that it allows some of the nutrients to pass more easily. And so there, there are a number of, of factors that, that, that come in. When we, uh, but, but really, the, today we're talking not as much about growth promotion with the antibiotics mm -hmm. as obviously with treatment. And that's, that's where the, the producers are using them uh, today. Uh, very, very minimal use on a growth promotion standpoint. Uh, there's, there's a few, few of the antibiotics that are still available uh, for growth promotion, but uh, they're really used at a much level, l lower level today because producers are, are trying to minimize their use and are trying to use them only when they believe they're getting a health benefit and, and when they have situations where the pig's welfare is at risk, and so using them, much like we try to use them on the human side uh, when it's a welfare issue. Now, in your um, presentation, you also talked about the non-dietary options. Mm -hmm. Could you 
review those for us? Well, one of the uh, the ones I talked about obviously is, is starting with a healthy herd. If you start with a, with a low disease presence and especially the bacterial diseases, you reduce the need for antibiotics in the first place. And so it it's really difficult to start with a high uh, level of disease and and try to raise pigs without antibiotics. The second one that I talked about really and, and is one that we're doing a lot of research trying to, to delve into is colostrum production and, and intake by the pig. And so we, we want to make sure that we have, have high colostrum production and, and high quality colostrum uh, because if, if a pig has low level of colostrum intake, we know that their chances of both survival uh, out of the farrowing house is greatly diminished and then their chances of have, having a disease problem in the nursery is also increased if they don't have adequate classroom consumption. I think just about everybody at this conference would uh, agree that post weaning is the most stressful mm -hmm. period yes. of, a, of a pig's life. What can you do nutritionally to minimize stress? Well, well, I think one of the things we want to think about is, are we, uh, getting back to the diets, is are there any ingredients that we have in the diet that are going to challenge the pig? And so is it going to challenge their digestive system that, that they can't easily digest it? Is it going to reduce feed intake? Is it going to, um, to give them any other nutritional factors? And, and so there, you know, if we look at things like mycotoxins. We want to make sure that we don't have mycotoxins present. We want to make sure that we have the right vitamins and trace minerals in the diet and the right levels of, of the macro minerals. And that our calcium level isn't too high because of the buffering capacity and what it takes for the pig to deal with producing too much acid um, to deal with excess calcium. So there's a lot of minor things that we have to think about, um, but, but they all come together to put together a package that, that gives the pig less of a challenge immediately after weaning. We've been talking to Mike Tokash. He is a nutritionist and a extension swine specialist at Kansas State University. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.